Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here on a, <laughs> a rainy, at least it's not snow. I mean, it's <laughs> such a yo-yo winter. I mean, every other week it seems we get a snowstorm. <clears throat> I think it's over now, and we're delighted. I, uh, but we do mimic London weather today, and we thought we'd make our guests feel comfortable here, where it's a little gray and overcast and moss grows on the side of almost everything. So welcome. We're delighted to have you here. I especially want to say thank you to Secretary of State Fallon for putting us on his agenda. It's a very busy day that he has here today. He's going to spend a fair amount of time uh, in conversations with uh, Secretary Carter because there are a lot of issues that we're wrestling with. We, the United States, thankfully, we're wrestling with them, uh, we're wrestling them with uh, an indispensable ally, and uh, I think that one of the things I was talking with the Secretary of State before, but, and saying, you know, what, is there a message he's bringing? And he says, yeah, we're still here. We're still the strongest ally you have, and we're still building the strongest program possible, and don't worry about us. And I think it's that kind of courage and conviction that we have counted on for what, these 70 years, where we've, uh, we've frequently argued with each other because we're close friends, and that's what friends do, but we're so united to find solutions together. And uh, that's what we're going to hear today, I think, from uh, Secretary of State. Uh, I think he is a leader that we all need, we in Washington need at this time, because we are facing some astounding challenges uh, as allies and as, uh, as a country. Uh, we have a very new complex challenge uh, you know, with Russia. I think the Secretary of State is going to talk about that a bit, and I hope that you will ask him questions about that, because I think it's an important part of the dialogue we need to be hearing here. We're not having enough of a national debate uh, about this in Washington, and of course we know the challenges we have in the Middle East, and we're together on this. So. Uh, it's a rich opportunity for us. I want to thank all of you for coming. And would you please, with your applause, welcome the Secretary of State for Defense, Sir Michael Fowler. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks. Well, good morning. And I'd like to thank uh, CSIS for hosting this event. And thank you, John, for that very kind introduction. It's a Real pleasure to be back in the United States, a country with which we have so much in common. History, culture, language, most of the time, <laughs> and also, but also those fundamental values of justice, of freedom, of the right to choose our governments, and above all, of the rule of law. In a year of poignant anniversaries, it's worth recalling that these were the values that were fought for at great cost 150 years ago under the leadership of that great defender of liberty, your 16th president, tragically assassinated just a mile or so away from where we meet this morning. Abraham Lincoln, whose memory is rightly honored in London with a statue facing our parliament, knew that for our values to flourish, they must rely on the rule of law. And in modern times, we defend that rule of law internationally, as well as at home. Our presidents and prime ministers, from Roosevelt and Churchill, Reagan and Thatcher, to President Obama and David Cameron, have been unequivocal in saying that where those values are threatened, we must act. As a young member of parliament back in 1984, I had the enormous privilege of meeting Ronald Reagan on his way to the 40th commemoration of the Normandy landings. He spoke the following day at Omaha, Allied forces coming, and I quote, not to take, but to return what had been wrongly seized, not to prey on a brave and defeated people but to nurture the seeds of democracy amongst those who yearn to be free again. Just as together we broke the bonds of totalitarian tyranny in the Second World War, so we faced down the 
threat of communism and the Cold War to win freedom for the peoples of Eastern Europe. More recently, we fought side by side in Afghanistan against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban who nurtured them. We helped ensure that nearly seven million Afghan children now go to school, that eight million Afghans were able last year to vote for a new president. And crucially, we prevented Al-Qaeda from repeating their attacks on our streets and cities. And when I recall the sacrifice and bravery of our troops, 453 British lives, 2,356 American lives. I think of Lance Corporal Josh Leakey, last month awarded our very highest honor, the Victoria Cross. In an operation against the Taliban, he sprinted not once, but three times under heavy machine gun fire to evacuate casualties, to recite guns, to return fire and turn the tide of the battle. That was a remarkable act of bravery. But one thing about it wasn't so remarkable, but typical. This was a combined UK-US Marine Corps assault. And one of the lives he saved was that of an American, US Marine Corps Captain Boshan, an example of how our two militaries worked together. On Friday, our Queen and country will remember not just his bravery, but the sacrifice and service of all our personnel in that conflict at a special service of commemoration at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Now, of course, our role in Afghanistan is not over. We have some 500 troops in the con that country alongside US troops, supporting the Afghans to take full advantage of the opportunity that those sacrifices have given them. We are committed to seeing that mission through. More broadly, it is perhaps easy to forget that the last quarter of a century, although punctuated by periodic crises, has been one of relative peace. Political scientists tell us the proportion of people killed in violent conflict fell to its lowest recorded point, and economies grew, raising millions out of poverty. That success since the end of the Cold War was built upon the consolidation of an international rules-based order that codified the rights and obligations of states and peoples. And that order did not come about by accident. It was underpinned by states working together, not least under the leadership of the United States for their collective defense and to deter those tempted to misbehave. Of course there were challenges, there always are, but broadly that system has held. Now we cannot, we must not, take the international rules-based order for granted. And today we are seeing a new set of multiple concurrent challenges to that order that many seasoned practitioners and thinkers believe is unprecedented, a point that Senator McCain made so cogently in his speech at the Munich conference last month. In Europe, we have seen Russia seek to change an international border by force and destabilize a neighboring sovereign state, something we thought we had consigned to history. In the Middle East, we see the Daesh trying to establish a caliphate the size of the United Kingdom and spanning the borders of Syria and Iraq. And in Africa, we see Boko Haram causing mayhem in northern Nigeria and along its borders with Cameroon, Niger, and Chad. These are new forms of fascism for our times, a perversion of Islam in the Middle East and North Africa, and a subversion of democracy in Eastern Europe. So what is to be done about it? First, we must properly understand the nature of the threats we face, whether hybrid warfare in Eastern Europe or the Daesh's twisting of Islam. Second, we should deal appropriately but resolutely, together with our international partners, with the challenges we face. And thirdly, 
we have to ensure that we have the continuing credibility and capability to deter anyone else tempted to do us harm or further challenge the international rules-based order on which our security and prosperity depends. So let me assure you that the United Kingdom, like the United States, has no intention of lowering its guard. We should play now to our strengths, those values we share that have stood the test of time, our partnership with long-standing allies and friends, and our capacity for innovation and the development of new technologies. So let me say just a word or two on each, on capability, on partnerships, and on innovation. First, on capability, we have to be credible as well as capable. And we have to be readier than ever to respond to multiple crises simultaneously. Our Strategic Defense and Security Review recognized this back in 2010. As a consequence, our armed forces have been reformed to provide the agility and deployability at scale that we need to deter and, if necessary, to engage. We have that capability now, and we are investing in the future. We've committed not to reduce our army any further, and we're adding reserves. We've committed to an equipment plan of $163 billion, $250 billion over the next 10 years. And we've committed to maintaining our continuous at-sea nuclear deterrent for which we secured a resounding 329 vote majority in Parliament earlier this year. Today I'm announcing a £285 million investment in further design work for the next generation of our nuclear deterrent submarines, replacing the Vanguard class over the next decade. We have today almost 200,000 people in uniform, and we use them. Last year, our army deployed on over 300 missions in over 50 countries of the world. We can deploy a division in the field with sufficient notice, and very few countries can still say that today. We're building seven new hunter-killer submarines. The first of our two new aircraft carriers, the biggest ships the Royal Navy has ever had, was launched last year. And just last month, we made an almost £1 billion commitment to our future frigate program. We're investing heavily in developing our cyber capability. We've expanded and modernized our air transport, our air-to-air -air refueling, and our helicopter fleets. We're the only other country, apart from the United States, operating the Rivet Joint Electronic Surveillance Aircraft, and we've contributed it, AWACS aircraft, and Sentinel to bolster the I-Star picture against ISTAR. We have a Tornado and the hugely impressive Typhoon fast jets in service. We're tier one partners in the Joint Strike Fighter program with British pilots and British planes already flying. This is a set of capabilities that few countries outside the United States can match. And we've been setting them to work. In Iraq, our Royal Air Force has struck some 176 targets in support of ground forces, degrading the dash and gathering vital intelligence. Our troops have trained over a thousand Peshmerga and will be stepping up support in counter IED this month. We stand ready too to contribute to the training of the Syrian moderate opposition. Meeting me in Kuwait last week, General Terry recognized our role as second only to yours, the indispensable partner, to use the President's words, not mine. So that brings me to the second pillar on which our future defense must rest, and that's partnerships. Complex global problems require global solutions. They can't depend on the United States alone or even on just the United States and the United Kingdom. Together, we've helped form an international coalition of some 60 nations 
against the Daesh, to cut their funding streams, to stop extremists crossing borders, to degrade their capability, to start to discredit their poisonous ideology. And we're working with you to reform NATO, the bedrock of our defense in Europe. Make no mistake here, we're after the same thing together. You want Europe to do more to pay its way in defense. So do we. You want to see an end to the decline in Europe's defense spending that has a quarter of the alliance spending less than 1% of GDP on defense and 20 of the 28 members spending less than 1.5%. So do we. It was our prime minister standing shoulder to shoulder with your president in Wales that called on NATO nations to step up their commitment and that helped to quicken the pace of change. Getting all NATO nations to agree to reverse the decline in their spending, to invest 20% of their defense budgets in equipment capabilities, including emerging areas such as cyber, and to set up a very high readiness joint task force that can respond in days, not weeks, to a breaking crisis. Once more in the UK, we are leading by example. We are one of only four countries already meeting the 2% target. We exceed comfortably the requirement to spend 20% on new equipment. And we will be among the first framework nations to lead that very high readiness joint task force. We have led the way in the European Union on imposing tough sanctions on Russia. We have contributed typhoon fast jets to the Baltic air policing mission, and we will do so again this year. We have significantly increased our exercise program in Eastern Europe, both to reassure our allies and to remind President Putin of our commitment to Article 5. I announced last week further support for the Ukrainian armed forces, including infantry training and non-lethal equipment. We are considering further requests for help. While NATO is at the heart of our defense, bilateral relationships are also important. They often allow us to get the job done more quickly and more effectively. We're working with France on our future missile requirements, on unmanned combat air systems. This year, we will test the UK-France combined joint expeditionary force. And having patented the concept, we're now developing a new joint expeditionary force with the UK leading six like-minded nations from Northern Europe to deliver a new highly flexible force able to respond to NATO and other contingencies. Of course, British influence extends far beyond Europe. In the Gulf, where I was last week, we now consider the British defense presence in Bahrain, Qatar, the UAE, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait as a strategic whole, having recently signed an agreement for a new naval base in Bahrain, giving us, for the first time, a permanent presence east of Suez since 1971. These partnerships are inherent in the international rules-based system, and they are, of course, crucial to defending it. Finally, let me say a few words about innovation. Reading the other day Lincoln's second annual message to Congress, I noted he said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves. That means, as your Defence Department is doing already, thinking anew about how we design and generate our forces and how we deploy them. As the Defence Department's Innovation Initiative underlines, if we are to succeed in overcoming the challenges we face, we need to maintain our technological edge. As emerging economies compete for fifth-generation technology, we have to continue to innovate. We're proud in the UK that we publish some 16% of the world's top quality research. 
but we're keen to do more to harness the intellectual power of our academics, our scientists, our engineers, and the private sector. So we have protected our research and development budget. We're working with British industry to set up a new defense solution center, which will create the capability and technology to respond to future international opportunities. As your offset strategy reminds us, at a time of constrained defense budgets, we benefit enormously from working together. We're already collaborating with you on around 100 distinct research and development programs, and we're deepening that collaboration. The US-UK Science and Technology Communique, signed last year, has already spawned several new ventures. In the summer, Genesis, a new UK-US early career scientist exchange program, will begin covering priority areas such as space, data analytics, operational energy, cyber, and autonomy. And we are also working with a new network of quantum technology hubs being set up across the UK with experts from the United States joining forces to investigate the full potential of quantum imaging. This is the first time that the United States has engaged in such a strategic, wide-ranging agreement to carry out underpinning research with another country. So let me say in conclusion, as we look now towards our new defense review, due to start after our election in May, when the key challenges I've spoken about will be reviewed and discussed in depth, we will continue to work closely with your Defense Department and with the US military, because it is in both our interests to keep broadening and deepening our partnership. No two countries have invested more materially and intellectually in building the international rules-based system than we have. No one is better equipped to defend those values than we are. And no one, no two countries, have a stronger working relationship. Our ability to operate together is unparalleled. We have an unrivaled level of understanding, grounded in history, forged through operations, and perfected through advanced joint exercises, through training and defense education. As Abraham Lincoln again said in a letter he wrote to the people of Manchester, now inscribed on a statue in that same city, fittingly in Lincoln Square, he said, whatever misfortune may befall your country or my own, the peace and friendship which now exists between the two nations will be, as it shall be my desire to make them, perpetual. We share Lincoln's desire. That is why we will continue to stand by your side, ready, willing, and able to act, as we have always done, to safeguard the international rules-based system upon which we both depend and to defend the frontiers of freedom. Thank you. Are we going to sit down? Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Secretary Fallon. Those were fantastic, uh, rich remarks. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at the Center for Europe and Eurasia. And your remarks have given us a wonderful range of, of questions and discussions. What I thought we'd do this morning is I'll, I'll moderate a few questions here with the Secretary and then open uh, our floor to questions. I should warn you, CSIS audiences are very tough. They ask very tough questions. So I'm the mere warm-up act to get you prepared for, uh, for the oncoming questions. Um, I, I have to say, as I've been watching the, the news and reading the press papers, uh, the newspapers, I, it's been quite extraordinary to hear so many US officials coming out and, and expressing their public concerns about 
uh, the United Kingdom's commitment to defense spending, General Odinero, of course, Ambassador Powers a few days ago, because your description was so robust of, of what you're doing. Why do you, why do you think uh, the, these comments are coming forward? Are they not aware of these activities? Do they, do they sense because of the upcoming election there's still some uncertainty about the, US, uh, the UK's defense commitment? Well, first of all, let's look at some of these individual comments. Ambassador Powers actually praised our exceptional contribution. She recognized what we were doing, for example, in Sierra Leone, where we sent a, a ship and helicopters and some 700 men. At 10 days, it took us 10 days to throw them down there to tackle Ebola. She described the United Kingdom as a staunch ally. In fact, she made it clear, as I did, that one of her missions in Brussels was to uh, drive up the uh, commitment of other members of NATO to uh, increase uh, their spending to, uh, alongside our lines. So I didn't see anything in her remarks that was at all critical of the, of the United Kingdom uh, uh, posture. I think, you know, in answer to your question, I think, um, you know, these are uncertain times. We face these uh, new, uh, these new threats uh, from uh, Russian aggression and uh, from the Daesh in the Middle East, and I think it's only natural for people to, uh, uh, to seek reassurance as to whether we have the capability and the will to deal with them. So I've described this morning, we certainly have the capability. In response to General Odeco, we can, we can, as I said, field a division. Um, we can still do that. Uh, I'm not sure any other country outside the United States and, uh, and the alliance can, can do that. We can uh, do that. And above all, we have the political will. We, you've seen that contribution alongside you in the Middle East. You've seen it in Afghanistan as well. And just to, to follow on that conversation, and I, I have to say as we, we get closer to May 7th and we're watching uh, this process very closely, it seems there's a very interesting dynamic among uh, political parties about making this commitment to the 2 percent. Prime Minister Cameron, of course, made the commitment uh, to reach the 2 percent of GDP at Wales. Is this just is a political dimension that we don't understand? Have you recommended to Prime Minister Cameron that this just the, the Conservative Party just make this commitment to we will spend 2 percent if, if re-elected? Well, first of all, I was with uh, your President and Prime Minister Cameron in, in Wales. This was a very important public commitment by NATO, something that hadn't been done in that form before, to arrest the decline in spending and really to encourage those members, as I say, who are a long way off um, the level of spending that, uh, that you've committed and that we commit to, uh, to raising their spending. And it's worked. Some, uh, some members now are beginning to uh, up their spending, uh, but they've, uh, but they've uh, a long way still uh, to go. Now, we have committed to the 2%. We're spending 2% this financial year. We're going to go on spending 2%. We're spending 2% in the next uh, financial year. We have later this year, as well as a strategic review we do every five years, we have a spending review to set the spending pattern for the three uh, consecutive years after that. And we can't forecast the exact uh, outcome of that at the moment. One last election-related question, and then I want to move on to, to Russia. Um, so there's been some concern expressed that, uh, that there's a potential that if the Labour and the Scottish National Party join forces in a formal coalition, that could perhaps jeopardize uh, the placement of uh, the uh, nuclear deterrent in Scotland. Again, is this just part of a lot of election jostling, or is there something for American audiences to be concerned? Uh, well, first, first of all, the, all successive governments have supported the nu independent nuclear continuous at sea deterrent. And uh, we had a, a debate on it in Parliament back in January, and we had this massive uh, majority committing to it from uh, both uh, Conservative and Labour MPs, a majority of only of 329, I think only 35 members out of the entire House of Commons actually voted against it. So there is that commitment. Successive governments, Labour and Conservative, have been committed to it, and you have both main parties who still remain committed to it. And I think it would be wholly wrong for the future of our defence to be part of some rather squalid horse trading 
between, uh, uh, between, between the parties, which in any case is presuming on the verdict of the electorate. We're not anticipating a coalition government. We're going flat out for, for a majority, and we think that's the, uh, the safest route for the British people. I promise to move away from domestic politics and go to something uh, perhaps a more tumultuous, uh, European security in Russia. Last week, Foreign Secretary Hammond noted that Russia perhaps poses the greatest threat to British security. Um, and I'm wondering, I would welcome your, your thoughts. You, you yourself uh, a few weeks ago said that there was a real and present danger that the Baltic states may face. Um, the UK has made a, a significant commitment in 2017 to lead the uh, very high uh, joint task force, readiness task force. What is your long-term, medium to long-term assessment of the threat that Russia poses to Europe? Well, certainly in the Baltic states feel this uh, Cuba, very, yes. very, uh, very sharply. They see, the, uh, uh, they see what Russia has been doing in the Ukraine. They feel this level of intimidation, the incursions into European uh, airspace and the maritime missions that Russia has been conducted. Uh, they feel very exposed at the moment, and that's why we have made this commitment to a series of reassurance measures, repeating the uh, contribution to the Baltic Air Policing uh, Mission, um, sending British troops to exercise again in the autumn on the eastern uh, flank of NATO, and stepping right up to the plate so far as the uh, very high readiness uh, task force is concerned. We're committing not simply to act as a framework nation in 2017, but I think we're the only country so far that is uh, committing to uh, provide uh, um, staffing for the two new regional headquarters in Stettin and Bucharest and the six uh, forward integration unit, uh, uh, units that are being set up in the three Baltic countries and in uh, Poland, Romania and Bulgaria as well. So we see, uh, we see that uh, danger very clearly and we think what's really important is that NATO needs to make clear to President Putin that uh, it is ready to respond, that they will react, that we will react, that we will make a reality of our commitments in NATO to defend any member of NATO that is attacked. And uh, the President should be in absolutely no doubt about that. How, what is your sense of uh, the current ceasefire, and I put that in quotes because we still have reports of um, violence, uh, Ukrainian soldiers' deaths, civilian deaths. Um, if we see where escalation continues, additional territory is seized, would that be something that the British government would contemplate uh, NATO's permanent presence, uh, a much more significant permanent presence on its eastern flank in the Baltic states and Poland beyond the measures, the reassurance measures that have already been taken? Well, Ukraine, as you know, is not a member of NATO, so we have to approach uh, the, the Ukraine issue separately. Um, there clearly can't be a military solution. There's a military dimension to the Ukraine crisis. We need the Minsk agreements implemented in full, um, and, um, and we need re reassurance that uh, on the Russian and separatist side that they are fully complying. Uh, we don't see any need to relax sanctions until we're absolutely confident that the Minsk agreements are being implemented. We have led the way on the imposition of sanctions and on the need to keep rolling the sanctions over until we see those agreements uh, properly uh, complied with. So far as uh, bases are concerned, we think what's important is uh, the reassurance we can offer by larger scale exercises, more continuous exercises, exercises conducted under the NATO umbrella rather than bilateral arrangements. And uh, that's what we are committing to this year and we're urging other countries to do so too. I read a statistic, it may not be correct, that since Prime Minister Cameron took office, uh, there have been uh, Russian uh, uh, overflights, perhaps not the right term, but Russian aircraft uh, uh, requiring scrambling capabilities 43 times since the Prime Minister took office. What is your interpretation of this much more active uh, testing of air sovereignty? There's been some testing of maritime sovereignty. What is, how do you view that? Well, we see that as uh, Russia testing the, the response of NATO members, and it's very important that we do respond, and we, we put our planes up there. 
I think it, we should be careful and point out that we've not had incursions into our own Correct. domestic airspace. Correct. Uh, but equally, these flights are being flown with uh, no response from the pilots involved. They're not filing fly pans or using transponders or even when they're up there and we have uh, our aircraft uh, patrolling our airspace uh, alongside them, there is no communication. They're not responding to any communication. So these are you know, flights that are unnecessary, they are uh, provocative, and frankly, they're dangerous. Yes. And um, you know, the, we need the Russians to, to accept that. On Monday, Senator Menendez, the uh, ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, called for the United States to rethink its forced posture in Europe, that the crisis over Ukraine and, 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 and Russia, uh, the threat that Russia poses requires a rethink. How would you characterize sort of U.S. Uh, security leadership in Europe. Uh, we just had some additional base reductions uh, uh, that have, you know, we've been removing assets from Europe. Would you concur that uh, the United States needs to rethink its force presence in Europe? No, I'm not here to uh, lecture the uh, United States on its uh, posture. The United I think States. We've been lecturing you a little bit. Well, <laughs> the, the United States, you know, led in at the NATO at the NATO summit and played a key role in driving in driving the. Uh, some of the weaker brethren to increasing their defense spending and signing up to that uh, particular commitment. And it's for the United States to decide where it uh, deploys its, uh, its bases. But it's also for us in Europe to do more. And one of the uh, messages I want to get over today is when you're calling on Europe to do more, so are we. Uh, when you have, as I say, of course, seven of the 28 members spending less than 1% on their defense, you know, they need to do more. And we're alongside you in that particular call. So when European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker calls for a European army, is that a, 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 a call for doing more? I, would you, uh, is that what we, where we want to go? Uh, no, that's not where we want to go. Um, um, you know, that national defense is a, you know, is a, is a matter for, for the nation states. It's not a matter for um, the European Union. And we have been very careful to uh, urge uh, uh, an, an end to any unnecessary duplication between the European Union and NATO. There are some European Union uh, operations that have been in Bosnia in terms of peacekeeping and in uh, policing uh, piracy off the, off the Horn of Africa. But uh, it's very important we don't get that mixed up with the uh, defense of the, uh, of the NATO area because the membership of NATO obviously is different to that in the European Union. And in the end, I mean, defense is a matter for, for nation states. So you've been in this position, you arrived July of last year. I have to ask one, what has been the most surprising aspect of your job as defense secretary? Well, it seems to be pretty busy since July. We had the, <laughs> Very busy. the evacuation in Libya, the shooting down of the airliner, the, uh, the uh, onslaught of, of, of the Daesh right up to the gates of Baghdad. Uh, the NATO preparations for the NATO summit, uh, the, the tackling uh, Ebola, and then this uh, uh, continuing aggression in the Ukraine. So there's been plenty to do. What I think has struck me most of all is um, the uh, number of states that now look to be on the point of failure, which is something I probably should have been more aware of, but just the fragility of uh, states faced with... Um, uh, some form of insurgency or, or other um, that um, uh, really do need uh, propping up and the instability of great swathes of West Africa or the Middle East that uh, in the end you know, can come back and, and threaten our security in Europe. I have to say, just on that final note, uh, one question I was thinking of is in 2011, as uh, British and French colleagues were, were very focused on, on uh, airstrikes in Libya. Uh, the, the U.S. was reluctant, but then engaged, and then NATO operations became Operation Unified Protector. What we see today in Libya, uh, although a successful air ca campaign has led to pretty tragic and dramatic consequences of a failed state that now threatens Europe's security from, from an immigration standpoint, from instability and insecurity there, it's... Uh, uh, to me, that was a, uh, has been a, a, a transition period where there was engagement, but not on the ground, and now we have dire consequences from that operation. 
Well, you described the air campaign in Libya as successful, and I don't think we should regret it. We, you know, we gave uh, Libya the chance to explore a better future without Gaddafi. And uh, that hasn't turned out uh, as, uh, as well as everybody hoped. Um, and we've got to redouble our efforts to uh, drive some political settlement. We have the parties in Libya now meeting together for the very first time, something that we've encouraged with uh, uh, UN Ambassador Leon. We have uh, Jonathan Pohl working there as well. Uh, it's something we've encouraged. Um, um, in the end, that has to be the solution. Um, those forces that uh, um, are prepared to uh, reject the Daesh have to work together in Libya and, uh, and work towards a stable political settlement. Fantastic. All right. Well, that was your warm-up. I think you're ready for all, oh, and I see lots of hands. You are ready for your audience. Just to remind you, uh, we'd like you to uh, offer your name, your affiliation. We'd like to keep our questions short so uh, the secretary can respond to them. I think if it's all right with you, we'll take a few questions and bundle them sure. together. I can give you a sure. paper and pen there, and then we'll take them. So I think we'll just start up front here, please. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you so much. Hi, sir. Uh, Vaga Maradian from Defense News. Heather, thank you very much, and thank you, sir, for your comments. Um, there is a lot very positive about the British investment in defense capability. Um, obviously, with the introduction of the new carriers, um, tremendous air capability, strike capability. But ultimately, it's a size and mass question. And one of the things I think that folks here are talking about is, for example, the Royal Navy having to scrape uh, you know, the waterfront to get the manpower they need to be able to deploy ships at this very, very aggressive cycle. Um, folks from each of the services have said the challenges that they face in that. Um, how do you alleviate that fundamental burden? I mean, I think that's one of the questions that, um, for example, Ray Odierno, uh, General Odierno is talking about as well, is there's a tremendous amount of capability, but it's a very, very close run thing each time, especially at this pace of operations that you're going on, and a persistent concern that the next defense review is going to mean deeper cuts, more of a reduction, reduction in people. How do you address that fundamental people challenge that you have tremendous capability but may simply not have enough bodies to put against all of the missions that you're signing them up for? Fantastic. I think we have Sir right there. In the, in the, we could pass it. You can, I should just pass it to. We'll take two more questions. Please, Sir. Bill Sweetman with Aviation Week. Um, on the 2% on the question, um, I'm puzzled as to why it's, it seems to be difficult at the moment for the government to say um, we will commit the next spending review to sustain 2%. Um, that does seem to be an area of concern, um, and there does seem to be concern that if 2% is sustained, it'll be sustained by moving things like GCHQ within the defense budget. Um, can, you, can you address that question and uh, say whether there's any possibility that such a commitment will be made in advance of the election. And sir, if you could just pass that right behind you, sir. Thank you. And then we'll, we'll allow you to answer. Sir, please. And a little different tack. Kevin, Kevin Wensing is my name, a retired Navy captain. Uh, a lot of the King Abdullah from Jordan, uh, General Sisi, a lot of leaders in the Middle East have had education in British military schools. Uh, with the U.S., you know, relationship with Egypt maybe a little bit less than it was, how, how is the U.K influencing people in Egypt, other countries in the Middle East, through those long-term relationships that they got from uh, Br British military schools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Secretary. Okay, well, there are two or three points there. Um, first, I hope you can't, we can't have this criticism both ways. You can't say Britain hasn't got the capability and then, ask, then say to me, well, you've got the capability, but can you actually man it? I hope you recognize um, we are investing again. The reason we're able to invest again is because we sorted out our defense budget, just as we sorted out our public finances generally. We had a defense budget that had a huge black hole, stuff ordered but not properly financed, and we've sorted that out to the, to the extent to which we are trusted by the Treasury now to develop a 10-year equipment plan, as I described, 164 billion pounds sterling spread over the 10 years, which is enabling us to build seven hunter-killer submarines, two aircraft carriers, 600 armored vehicles, invest in joint strike fighter, and, uh, and the rest of it. So, you know, we, we, have, the, we have the finance to uh, construct and modernize these new platforms. So far as uh, manning them is concerned, um, we are, as the economy expands, 
and these platforms become increasingly uh, high-tech, if I can put it that way. We are competing with the rest of the economy for um, uh, some of the same people, for engineering skills, for technical qualifications, both at, uh, um, at rating level and, and at uh, officer and, uh, and graduate level. So we have to uh, modernize our approach to employment like any other employer, and we are looking at, um, at uh, modernizing our employment model, uh, the way we can appeal to those who might not want to join the services as you did in the old days for maybe 25, 30 years, but maybe only want to join for a shorter period. Uh, we have to look at these things to make sure we have a properly flexible pay structure that can recognize uh, the realities of modern life, that people may not want to commit for very long uh, periods, and we need to incentivize them appropriately, and make sure, too, that um, those um, with those engineering and technical skills uh, don't feel they have to abandon that work to get promotion, that they can retain. We need to be much more flexible in the commands as to the way we look at um, the, the overall structure. You did refer, finally, to sort of deeper cuts coming. And let me just reassure you what we said and what the Prime Minister emphasized again yesterday. We are uh, committed to maintaining a regular army of 82,000. We're not planning future large-scale redundancies. The last of the big redundancies was announced just before I took office, back in June. You know, and we're not plan we're planning to keep the army at around 82,000. What we're adding to it are reserves. So we're not planning uh, deeper cuts in, uh, in the level and um, structure of our uh, armed forces. Um, the question on the 2% on the and the, um, the commitment, we have made commitments, as I've uh, said, to the equipment budget, to the uh, uh, broad shape and size of our armed forces, and to maintaining and modernizing the continuous at-sea deterrence. So those are all part of uh, uh, our uh, longer-term commitment to defense expenditure. Um, you're asking to see a, a formula encompassing all that. You don't have to wait for the outcome of the strategic review um, later this year. I hope you'll be able to see that very clearly in our manifesto commitment that we set out in advance of the election in just a few weeks' time. You also asked me about the definition of, uh, of uh, spending that counts towards the 2%. This, of course, is a NATO matter. They have uh, their own particular classification. Of course, we uh, look at this from time to time as, it's, as the classification itself uh, can be revised. Uh, with the inclusion, for example, which we didn't used to do, but which you're supposed to do, of, uh, of uh, war pensions within, the, within NATO spend and so on. So it's, uh, it's something uh, we'll obviously continue to look at. The third question uh, was about uh, Egypt. And uh, um, I, I think your issue was that the guys there weren't at Sandhurst and uh, suffer uh, from that. Um, and you're right, I mean, a, a large number of... Uh, uh, my fellow ministers or leaders in the Middle East um, benefited from, uh, from our training. I was with the King of Jordan last week, uh, who fondly remembers his time at, Amherst, at Sandhurst, and others um, were at Cranwell and the other colleges uh, and so on. Uh, but we've had a team in Egypt uh, uh, very recently, and we are looking to see how we can develop our military cooperation with Egypt, how we can help them on counter-terrorism, where they've had their own internal issues, as you know, down in Sinai, and um, whether we can work more closely with them with the, with the problem we have in, in Libya next door. So we are not uh, neglecting Egypt. On the contrary, we have been uh, uh, very recently uh, developing our relationship with them. Before I turn to the next round of questions, just a quick clarification. Can you help, uh, help me with the timeline of the SDSR? So obviously work is ongoing the election will occur, and then it will then, over the summer, th towards the fall, and then it will be produced in the fall. Is that the, is that the timeline for the release right now? Obviously, lots of factors uh, will change that dynamic. Uh, well, not quite. It's not ongoing. The, uh, the review starts after the election. Uh -huh. We've obviously been doing some uh, homework. <laughs> some homework, some thinking, yeah. some preparation of evidence. But the review okay. itself does not start until okay. after the election, and it does not only involve my department. It will be led by the Cabinet Office. It involves the uh, 
Home Office, uh, the equivalent of your Homeland Security Department. It involves the Foreign and Commonwealth Office as well. So it is a cross-government uh, exercise that will begin after the election and I hope will be completed uh, in the autumn. Uh, one thing I can say, and I hope I implied this uh, in my remarks, is that this will be more of an international exercise than before. Mm. We, and I'll be making this clear to Secretary Carter later today. We want to involve our key allies uh, in this uh, exercise um, more thoroughly than we've done uh, before. Not simply on procurement and collaboration, but when it comes to the various capabilities that we need to address. It is very important that we work with the United States and indeed with, uh, with France and our other key NATO allies. Fantastic. Lots of hands. So we'll do the, uh, the two right in the aisle, please. Get a microphone there. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kylie Morris, Channel 4 News' Washington correspondent. I wanted to ask you, given the high-level American criticism of uh, falling defence spending, uh, how much has your visit turned into a kind of damage control mission? And the 2%, going back to 2%, isn't it inconsistent of Britain to join the Americans in cheering other European countries to meet its 2% commitments when Britain itself is not prepared to make that long-term commitment at this stage. And finally, if I may, on the Islamic State group, there's been a video released today of a, a young boy uh, apparently executing uh, a captive who is allegedly an Israeli spy. Um, could I have your reaction to that? Thank you. Thank you. I think if you're just right across the aisle. Yes, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia Szafowska from the Polish uh, Embassy. Uh, just two questions. First, uh, regarding the Ukraine, what must happen, according to you, so that uh, Western, where the West decides to support uh, uh, non-lethal uh, weapons uh, to Ukraine? And the second one is concerns um, Syria. What uh, are your plans to support um, uh, moderate Syrian opposition? Thank you. It's okay, we'll take one more. Yes, ma'am, right here. The microphone's coming to you. Other side, other side, ma'am. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Tara McKelvey. I work for the BBC. Um, I'd like to ask you about cultural differences between Americans and Brits, something I am very interested in. And if you could talk about how US-UK cooperation is going, specifically about Islamic State, and I'm interested in hearing your reaction to the video and so on. Okay, well, let me, I'm not quite sure about the last question. Give me time to think about that. Um, let me start with the first one. I haven't seen, uh, for Channel 4 News, I've not seen the uh, video, I've seen a report of it. Um, but I think that, il if true, that illustrates again the, the depths of barbarity to which uh, uh, ISIL is, uh, is uh, sinking. And I think we'd all abhor the, uh, the use of children in that uh, particular uh, 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 beheading, if that, if that turns out to uh, be true. Um, can I refute any suggestion that I'm uh, here to uh, deal with uh, damage uh, to anything? I have set out today the, the facts of our engagement with the US, uh, the operations we've been doing together successfully in Afghanistan, we are doing together successfully in the Middle East in checking the halt of, and checking the advance of, uh, of ISIL and the uh, common position that we share against uh, Russian aggression in the Ukraine and to, uh, as I said, to explore some of the innovation and uh, the cooperation on new technologies that we're going to need as part of our joint offset strategy to better defend the international rules-based uh, system. I have set out very specifically that uh, it is, you know, we can still put a division in the field. And I have uh, noted uh, Ambassador Power's uh, um, recognition of our, the exceptional contribution that uh, we are making uh, to, uh, to NATO. Um, so far as the 2% is concerned, I've, I've made it clear that you know, we are the ones meeting the 2%. We're meeting it this year, we're meeting it uh, next year. Your question should be directed to those who are nowhere near the 2%, who are still below 1% uh, of uh, expenditure. Um, so far as the, um, um, uh, the question about um, uh, uh, ISIL is concerned, 
Um, yes, we're re I'm reviewing today with Secretary Carter, the, who was in the Middle East too, uh, just recently, and we're reviewing the uh, uh, state of the, uh, the campaign and what more needs to be done there, particularly to match uh, some of the uh, success that's being won on the ground and in the air with political progress too in ensuring that uh, uh, the ground that is being retaken from ISIL Daesh, the ground that is retaken, can be retaken with the support of the local population, that the Abadi government can demonstrate its uh, commitment to a wholly inclusive, uh, a wholly inclusive settlement in Iraq. So far as uh, um, supplies to Ukraine are concerned, we have supplied a range of non-lethal equipment. Uh, we are considering further requests for non-lethal equipment from, from the Ukrainian armed forces, and we are beginning our training support to those armed forces next week in the Ukraine. That will include um, uh, training to reduce the number of uh, b battlefield fatalities and casualties that they're taking to help them better protect themselves, as well as some basic uh, uh, infantry training alongside that. That will begin uh, next week, um, but obviously we will keep that, uh, keep that under review as we uh, see uh, uh, compliance with the Minsk agreements uh, unfold. Now, there was a third question about, what was it, the culture? Sort of, uh, sort of the you said there would be tough questions. Between, yeah, well, it's sort of explain, you know, how this U.S., U.K., how are the cultural differences, maybe put it the security perspective first. Uh, do you notice cultural difference in approaches uh, or, you know, a guide to how to get along with those Americans? Well, as I, as I illustrated in my speech, I think we do get along with those uh, <laughs> Americans. You know, we did that side by side in, uh, in Afghanistan. We're doing it uh, side by side down in the headquarters in, 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 in the Middle East. Uh, our planes are flying you know, day by day, night by night, alongside uh, American, uh, American uh, bombers. Uh, we are working extremely closely, and I don't think you'll find a partnership that exists anywhere else between two other countries that is as deep and as, as broad as our partnership with the United States. That's why and it is your own president who described us as the indispensable partner. And we remain your indispensable partner. Well, I think that's a great way to end the conversation. The special relationship is still vibrant uh, and active. Secretary Fallon, we thank you. You've uh, gone through in great detail the capabilities and the strengths of the British military. We wish you the best success with your meeting with uh, Secretary Carter. And of course, we're going to be watching May 7th very closely. So with that, please join me in thanking Secretary Fallon. Thank you.